Well, I think we're now live on Facebook. Hello, everyone out there. If you can hear us, please give us a like, uh, a love, a heart, a thumbs up. Uh, we would love to know that we're coming in loud and clear on your end of things. Um, my name is Lakeland Hogan. I'm gerontologist and caregiver advocate with Home Instead Senior Care, and I'm joined by Terry, uh, and she's with us against Alzheimer's. I'll do more formal introduction here in just a little bit. Uh, but we are so excited that you all have come to join us today. We want to know where you're coming from. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. Terry, I know you're on the East Coast somewhere. Where are you coming from today? I am in Rutherford, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Philadelphia. Awesome. So we have some people coming from Northern Canada. Uh, Jane, she chatted in. So if you're joining us, please chat in where you're coming from, whether on your, you're on Facebook, you can type it in the comments below. We have some people joining us from Lincoln, Nebraska. Hello, Renee. Uh, Diane from um, British, British Columbia. Uh, we have someone from Michigan joining, Toronto. So people, this is an international chat. This is fantastic. Um, love that you all are tuning in today. We're going to be talking about um, a lot of different things, but mainly focused kind of around the family dynamics of caregiving. Uh, so we're excited that you're joining us today on the chat, and we're going to get started here in just a couple of minutes. If you are on Facebook, if you didn't know, you can tag a friend or family member that you think might benefit from this chat. So all you have to do is comment in the comments box below. Uh, we will record this um, and put it back out there. So of course you can share it at a later date, but if you comment below and tag your friend or family member with the at symbol in their name, uh, it will get them connected to this chat. Uh, but if you're joining us again via Zoom, we're gonna record it and send it back out to you. We'll put it out on Facebook. So you can always forward it on at a later date. So I think hopefully everyone is settled in, uh, people are joining us on Zoom and on Facebook. I will be taking some questions live from everyone in just a bit, but I want to get the opportunity to introduce our guests and kind of set up our topic for today. So if you just joined us, my name is Lakeland Hogan. I'm gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Home Instead Senior Care. And I am joined by the wonderful Terry. Uh, she is with Us Against Alzheimer's. So hello, Terry. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, Lakeland. Wonderful. Well, I want to tell you all a little bit about Terry because uh, she has some personal and professional experience with Alzheimer's disease. So Terry Frangiosa, I hope I said that right, uh, she is a passionate Alzheimer's advocate with Us Against Alzheimer's and a longtime family caregiver caring for her mom who had Alzheimer's disease. She also oversees strategic health care, uh, strategic healthcare consulting firm, Frangiosa and Associates, LLC, uh, where she provides guidance on integrating expertise into product and disease strategies, medical and scientific communities, patient and advocacy efforts. Her interest in advocacy results resulted in the long-standing support of several organizations dedicated to support in brain disorders and breast cancer. She has applied her professional career experience and passion for advocacy to help create the A-list, which she's going to tell us more about in just a bit, as a channel for feedback from those diagnosed or at risk of Alzheimer's disease uh, or another type of dementia and their care partners, uh, and also individuals that are worried uh, about possibly getting Alzheimer's or dementia in the future. So uh, she'll tell us a little bit more about that in a bit. But again, Terry, we're so excited to have you with us today. Uh, I'm, I've known you for a while now, and I just uh, think that you're a great advocate in the space. So excited for our our viewers, our family caregiver following to get to know you a little bit and hear your story. Oh, thank you, Lakeland. And that was quite an introduction. <laughs> really, at the, at the heart of it, I am an advocate. I'm a, I, I still consider myself to be a caregiver. Uh, and uh, that has influenced my ability to want to do things that help other people along the journey. It's a journey where you need each other. We all need each other. And so it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I certainly am very blessed to be involved with Us Against Alzheimer's and the work that I'm doing with the A-list and with the team uh, around the A-list. 
I love that you said, you know, once you're a caregiver, it kind of sticks with you. You're always, you always kind of consider yourself a caregiver. And I think that's one of the neat things about our Remember for Alzheimer's Facebook group and the following on these live chats is it's not only people, you know, currently going through it, but people, you know, kind of stick with us. They want to help others. Uh, we put out a lot of um, kind of asks for advice from past caregivers on our various platforms, and we get an overwhelming amount of, of uh, tips and support uh, and bits of nuggets of wisdom uh, from those who have gone through this journey. So uh, yeah. I know that today we're going to be talking about some of that personal experience. But uh, for those out there that are listening, if you didn't know, uh, there are 16 million family caregivers that are caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. So this is a large group of individuals that are providing care and support. And we know that there are various challenges, kind of a roller coaster I've heard family caregivers describe. You know, there are some, some highs and there are some lows, uh, but there are certainly challenges that many families face as they walk through this journey with their loved one with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. So uh, today we're going to be talking about some of these challenges, Terry, aren't we? Because I know I'm sure you and your family have experienced quite a few challenges um, in your journey, but we know that, you know, family dynamics can be challenging, um, sharing the responsibilities, um, you know, there might be sibling conflict, um, and then there's also those emotions of caregiving, maybe guilt, resentment, frustration, uh, so there's so many challenges that an individual might experience, but hopefully learning from those who have kind of come before us uh, in their caregiving journey, hopefully we can help those that are kind of in the thick of it today, um, you know, provide some, some hope, some uh, tips, some resources, some information uh, to help them through this journey. So uh, Terry, I thought if you wouldn't mind kind of uh, before we really jump into some of those challenges, would you mind telling us a little bit about your caregiving journey? I know you said, um, I said earlier that your mother had Alzheimer's disease. So would you kind of uh, set the stage for us? How did you kind of first start to recognize the signs? Uh, and then how did your journey as a caregiver or care partner evolve as she, um, you know, progressed through, through the disease? Sure, I'm happy to. So I think my mother probably started having signs and symptoms in the early 2000s. Uh, the first part of my journey as a caregiver was long distance, which I'm sure many people can relate to. And so I didn't really know the full extent of her decline uh, real time. And my uncle was with her and would express confusion, frustration about what he was seeing and how she was acting. And I'll be very frank and say, I think there was a lot of denial on my part initially because I knew what it was gonna to mean to a change in all of our lives and how that might affect everybody emotionally and so forth. So I just really think I was in denial for a, a bit of time. Towards 2009, 2010, I think it got to be too much for my uncle. And I could see things, cabinets, her cabinets were, she had, you know, cough medicine in her kitchen cabinet with the containers or something in the refrigerator that shouldn't be there, that type of thing. So I was starting to get some signs. And then I got a call that um, from my cousin that uh, she was leaving the faucet on. And that was obviously concerning yeah. to everybody yeah. involved. So we said, okay, I think it's going to be time for her to move up and be in my care, be in our care. I do have a sister. Um, I actually had a larger property that would enable for my mom to be on my property, which was not possible for my sister in her environment. Um, but we were both, I would call us both caregivers, although my mother lived with me. And um, so in around 2011, my mother moved in with me and she was with me until she passed away in 2015, really from her Alzheimer's. Um, there was a lot of, when she moved in, I noticed a lot of repeating. We would get, my sister would get a call, the same call with a message 16 times in a row on her phone. Uh, and we'd be like, uh, it's only been a half an hour, <laughs> but the <laughs> message kept coming. Uh, and there were other strange behaviors like walking around outside at night and so forth. 
So we started to realize that it was getting to be more and more challenging. Uh, and I moved from a position in, I was in pharma for many years, 25 years, uh, and uh, I moved into my own consulting practice, which meant I could work from home, which was great because I could keep an eye on her. But then it got to the point where in the middle of meetings, there were disruptions, and I just, I just knew that it was the time to start getting some help in. Uh, so that is when I actually reached out to Home Instead, who helped uh, for several years uh, with my mom. Um, so that was, uh, I guess, where, where we enter that discussion. I don't know if you want me to go on with that. Yeah, no, I think that, I mean, it sounds like your journey, I'm sure people can relate um, to maybe the whole thing or, you know, various aspects, you know, being that long distance caregiver and, and then uh, recognizing that um, your mother needs to move in with you. I'm sure that wasn't an dis easy decision to make. And especially because it sounds like she had to move, um, you know, that distance because you were that long distance caregiver. And, um, you know, I, I talked to a lot of uh, family caregivers who had to modify their work scenario to, you know, provide care to their loved ones. So I'm sure people are relating to various aspects. And, uh, and then, you know, making that decision to hire in-home care. Last month, our live chat was actually about kind of that decision point. And we'll actually post the, the link to that. So if anyone wants to kind of go back and watch, um, it can be a hard decision to make to hire people to come into your mm -hmm. home to support. Um, can you kind of talk us through um, how you got to that decision? Was there any, I know, um, you through your A-list, which we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, throughout today's chat, uh, you also kind of surveyed some family caregivers too about, you know, that decision point. So can you just speak a little bit about that? Um, because I know that probably there's some family members, family caregivers out there that are at that decision point, you know, is it time? Um, what is it going to be like? Nervous to have essentially a stranger into my home. So yeah. talk us through that process. And there's definitely no right or wrong with this. I mean, I think it's definitely different for every person in every situation. For me, when my business, when I was concerned about how well I was going to do with my business, and it was an important time as I was launching my business, um, you know, I thought it was important to have some support there. Um, later, it was more for my mom's even safety and well-being. Mm -hmm. um, and I am, as you mentioned, uh, the lead investigator for the, the A-List, which is a research study we do with 8,000 people. We get them, you know, uh, to answer questions on a routine basis. And one survey that we asked them was around, you know, what are the types of things, that you, how do you know when it's time to put your loved one, have your loved one have some home health care? And they said keeping their person, their loved one safe uh, for personal, for better personal care and for companionship. Mm -hmm. And actually, I don't wanna underestimate the value of the companionship part because my mother was really um, very social. And over time, I think during the day and even at night, she became less and less social. So it was nice to keep that sort of motivation to be social with a companion. In the first you know, few years, uh, that my mother was pretty uh, able to get mobile, able to get around. Uh, they went to Phillies games, <laughs> they got their nails done. So uh, we used it as an opportunity for her to go out and with a friend from home instead. And that seemed to be a really nice way, way for her to be social in addition to helping me with errands and so forth. That's, that's great. I, I think that um, you know, we see those same reasons kind of float to the surface when people call us. It's, you know, um, to help with safety. Um, and also, you said help with personal care. You know, sometimes family members don't feel comfortable helping their loved one with that kind of more intimate personal care, whether it's bathing or helping them with restroom assistance. So, you know, that can be kind of a nice um, support system to have in home care, and then also that companionship piece, because you're right. And, and sometimes family members, um, 
enjoy having another person in the caregiving scenario, um, you know, to help with those repeated questions that you mentioned, your mom called your sister, you know, 16 times with the same question. So someone new to listen to their stories and to engage in activities with them that they enjoy. So I think you kind of touched on um, several of the more common reasons that we get calls for support for, for in-home care. Um, but I think, um, you know, from what I hear from your story and what I see in, in other caregiving scenarios is that things do kind of change over time. And so, um, you know, we know that Alzheimer's disease is unfortunately a progressive disease where an individual is losing more of their abilities to care for themselves and losing their ability to communicate. And I'm sure that really impacts family dynamics. And, um, you know, just based on your story, it kind of shifts caregiving responsibilities over time. Would you mind talking a little bit about that and sharing, uh, you know, how your family managed those dynamics, whether it was positively or maybe there's some things you wish you would have done better. Um, I think that those listening could really benefit from hearing more. Sure. And I'll say there's always things I think everybody feels like they could have done better. And yeah. I I try to just let it go to some degree, like be kind to myself. And I advocate for that for others because it's just, there's just, it's just not a situation where you come out of it ever. I don't think feeling amazed by how you did. Mm -hmm. I think there's just always something you, you feel like you could do better. That's my personal perspective. Um, yeah, there was definitely, um, Sort of a role change over time with me and my mother and my sister and my mother and that we heard also from our care uh, partners in the a-list that about two-thirds of um, individuals believe that there's a or feel the sense of a role reversal mm -hmm. as they move forward and um, so you're trying to get adapted to that in my case with my mom you know, as said, she started, you know, we, and we had her going out with Home Instead folks and doing errands. Oh, I'm so sorry. I got to start log back in. <laughs> All good. <laughs> I was trying to touch the button enough to make that not happen, but it happened. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, I think that um, over time, you know, they, they were inside and doing more things and doing laundry and just helping out and around the house. And then um, we, and my, for, as far as my husband and my sister go, uh, they had a pretty good role of um, support for me. Um, I, I really am super grateful that I've had such great support from my husband and my sister. Um, my husband, his greatest role, I think, was tolerance mm -hmm. and just enabling me to be myself and coaching me to be a little bit more patient with my mom at times. So I really appreciate that. My sister was the person that I would call and say, I need a break and I need it now. And she would come. So I think she really spent in some ways, she spent more quality time with my mom <laughs> than I was able to. I spent more quantity, but I was constantly doing things, trying to help my mom along. And it just, you know, I, I, was, the, I was the role reversal person. And so it, it was a little challenging that way. Um, where, but I, thankfully, I was able to call my sister. And I realized that's a blessing that a lot of people don't have. Um, so she would come over and give me a couple of hours to do something, get out and do yeah. something. And then uh, we went to, through a period of pretty sudden change where uh, my mom fell and broke her pelvis. And this was in the last year of her life. And um, then everybody's relationship changed. My sister was over a lot. We were all watching. It was a 24 seven care experience wow. then very stressful, very difficult. Home Instead was then on the night shift, the third shift for me. I still got up in the middle of the night and came down and talked to everybody but, um, that was in there, but uh, it was still the, nice to have the ability to get some rest at that point in time. And then I had, uh, you know, there was a period of time where we could function that way, but my mom was really just not doing well. So we had to put her into the hospital and then into rehab and ultimately she hospiced then. 
And in the long-term care facility, she was very confused about where she was and she would just scream for no reason. And so I was a little worried, like this is a great place and I want to make sure my mom can stay here. And so we actually had home instead come into the long-term care facility wow. and sit with her during the day and we would sit with her at night so that we were able to maintain her calm. So we've had, and my sister, of course, again, on this journey, my husband on this journey constantly uh, with me. So we've had multiple different types of experiences and uh, just, I think you just have to be ready to handle what's coming your way sometimes. And uh, that was part of the journey for us. It was, it was constantly changing. We did part of the anxiety that I think we experienced was we never knew what was going to happen next. And that was an anxiety that I still feel to some degree and try to manage um, because it just gets ingrained in you when you're in that experience. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like you, you did have to be kind of nimble and uh, kind of pivot where um, in scenarios where your, your mom needed different kind of support or uh, her condition changed and uh, kind of being flexible and kind of renegotiating the roles, it sounds like, mm -hmm. kind of had to happen at several different points. And I'm sure other people out there listening can definitely relate to that. Um, but my question to you is, you know, you said, you talked about, you know, some of the impact already, you know, it caused some anxiety, but uh, we know that caring for yourself as a caregiver, making time for yourself is so important, but so often that gets pushed to the wayside, understandably so, because there is so much to juggle, so much to manage. And when you're in it, you probably hear, you know, you know, as a caregiver, care for yourself and you think, oh, that would be great if I only had the extra time. So now that you're kind of on the other side of it, uh, Terry, can you talk a little bit about the importance of, of caring for yourself and maybe some things that you were able to do um, or things that you wish you would have been able to do that could have helped you with that kind of self-care along the way? Yes, absolutely. So, um, yes. Care, caregivers, as Meryl Comer would say, who I work with on the A-list, the caregiver is the second patient. And yeah. there, there's just no doubt that is the case. Um, you, you know, it's very difficult when you have a million things going on to prioritize yourself. I have come to realize sometimes I don't prioritize myself even now. Um, so I don't think that that is necessarily unique to caregiving. But I think that it is something that um, is, is just amplified <laughs> because you have one more thing on your plate and it, everything has to be done except for taking care of yourself. And so um, for me, um, I've kind of learned about that as I've gone on and I just encourage everybody one more voice, take care of yourself. You're on, you, I know you've all heard this before, you're on the flight and they, they say, please take your air mask for yourself before you take it for mm -hmm. your child. Yeah. It's a, such a, a non-instinctual thing to do in a way, but you have to be well. And I actually had an experience where I had, uh, while I was caregiving for my mom, I had pneumonia. I got pneumonia wow. and I saw the caregiver and actually the caregiver had to come up, the home instead caregiver had to come up and take care of me oh, and wow. literally get me out of hospital by making sure I was drinking fluids and eating crackers one day <laughs> because I was just not able to take care of myself. And I was like, this is just, we just, and my family was like, you have to take care of yourself. Uh, on multiple occasions. So I think having a support system is part of it. Um, my sister and I did run a marathon about uh, halfway through my caregiving experience with my mother in the house. So we're runners. Um, and uh, to me, an important part of caring for myself is absolutely running and just exercise. It's also a time for me to be social with friends, which is an important part of my care. And um, yeah, the other thing that I took up during my caregiving experience was meditation. 
uh, mm -hmm. which to this day really helps me just breathing. Uh, and, you know, doing one good thing for myself a day, whether it be meditation or something else, just something. When I'm going through a bad period of time, I have to do just one nice thing for myself a day, whether it's get a compliment or take a bath or instead of just rushing through things, um, whatever it is. Um, I like that too. Yeah, just kind of one thing. Start there. That's a good place to start. One small thing every day. Um, I, so I like those suggestions. Um, and you kind of already talked about about this, Terry. You know, now that you're kind of on the other side of things, um, you've been able to kind of reflect back on your experience as a caregiver. Um, can you just speak a little bit more to that? Because I think you know, hindsight's probably always twenty twenty. Uh, yeah. But you probably um, you know have had time to think about your your journey and um, you know in that reflection, um, you know, what would be some additional words of wisdom that you could pass along to those that are going through this journey today? Yeah, for me, one thing that was super important, besides doing that one nice thing for myself when I, you know, every day, uh, and exercise and meditation are sort of my saving grace, always, and any stress. Um, I, I think I learned a lot from my experience as a caregiver. One thing was, that all my feelings were valid. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had to, you know, sort of learn or tell myself, it's okay that you feel frustrated. It's okay. Like, you have to get those feelings out mm -hmm. and express them in a safe environment where people understand. I really liked a lot of UCS against Alzheimer's and some of the other actually Alzheimer's um, Facebook groups at the time to express my feelings. And I see people do that and I always tell them, your feelings are really valid and you have to be able to express them and to feel them. And you should not feel bad, you know, like there are many people that have expressed that they think about life after their loved one uh, and so forth. And I just tell people, you have to just feel your feelings and realize that's a normal part of going through this experience. And it doesn't mean you love your mother or your loved one any less. So that's one thing. Um, I believe that everything happens for a reason and I would not be doing what I'm doing as the you know, lead investigator for the A-list if I wouldn't have gone through the experience I went through. Yeah. So at the time, I sort of could say, kind of in the abstract, everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. But it really didn't resonate until later that that was the case. Um, I think that, um, you know, you don't, you can't always see what's in the path in front of you. What I said to myself a lot was this too shall pass, whatever that means, this too shall pass. And it always does. It's just, you know, you're going through things for quite a while. Meryl's been a caregiver, Meryl Comer's been a caregiver for over 20 years. So it's not always going to pass quickly. <laughs> but, um, your feelings of angst or your feeling of concern, it will pass. So just give it some time to let it pass. Um, yeah, guilt is another thing. Um, I hear that a lot. Yeah, I think everyone feels it <laughs> to some degree and no one deserves to feel it. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's just no right or wrong. And everybody has to do things in the way that they think is best. And I've seen so much uh, about guilt of having, you know, your loved one in a facility or not in a facility. I tried to keep my mom safe outside of a facility and she still had an accident. It's, what's going to happen is going to happen. And so I think that... Um, just allowing yourself to not feel like you're the controlling force in all of this and that, you know, things are going to happen the way they're meant to and you're going to do the best you can do, mm -hmm. I think is, for me, was helpful anyway. And then the, uh, maybe a last uh, thing to say would be empowerment was important for me. Yeah. I knew I was, you know, I wanted to do something with this energy that I had. I always caught the fire in my belly that I got during my caregiving experience. And I did indeed leverage it later. 
But um, even during that experience, empowerment was something that was important to me. And it's not easy. As somebody who has been in healthcare for 30 years, I still struggled quite a bit with empowering myself to do the right things, have the right information. It's not at your fingertips necessarily. So for me, that's always part of the journey that you might make you feel better if you're at least informing yourself as much as you can and being as vocal as you can along the way. Yeah. Which is the important of the, the importance for me of the A list. Yeah. And I, I, just in my work with the A-list, you know, over the years, um, my work with you and Meryl, um, I've seen that that is an opportunity for caregivers to be empowered, people living with dementia to be empowered, to share their voice. And so I would love for you to talk a little bit more about the A-list. I know we'll post a link in the chat boxes so you all can go out and find out more information, but uh, Terry, would you mind just kind of giving us an overview and, um, you know, how people can get involved? Because I think it is such uh, an impactful way, but yeah, a simple impactful way to get involved. You don't have to really leave your your comfy couch and your comfy clothes. <laughs> exactly. And that's why it was designed this way, actually. Um, so the A-list, as I mentioned, there's about 8,000 people in the A-list right now. About a year ago, we went out and we got a, what we call IRB approval, which is basically people outside of our A-list world are reviewing everything that we do and making sure it's ethical and that we have appropriate security, data security and so forth. And so they watch everything that we do and make sure that we're handling that data very carefully because that's super important to us. We've done about 20, I think I counted yesterday, 26 surveys <laughs> since wow. we started a couple of years ago. And um, from a variety of topics, uh, interest in clinical trials, uh, the burden that you experience as someone that has a diagnosis or your care partner, um, financial preparation, what you want in services, home health services was one. We did a survey with Home Instead, um, or uh, even for Medicare, we've done surveys and pr provided that feedback along to Medicare. Uh, for their thoughts around reimbursement of services. Um, everything from attitudes. We do a lot around things like Mother's Day. We did a survey around, and Father's Day. We did a survey around how you feel around the holidays. And do you have any tips for other individuals uh, so that they can get through the holidays as well as possible? So that type of thing. Um, and a lot around feelings and, and, and um, attitudes uh, along the journey of uh, being someone who has a diagnosis with Alzheimer's or um, is a care partner. So the membership, this 8,000 uh, person membership, are people that have a diagnosis, people that are at risk for Alzheimer's or MCI, uh, we have a number of current and former caregivers, and we think that they both bring unique and interesting perspectives. And we also have people interested in brain health. And we uh, recently, in September, actually did a survey on brain health mm -hmm. and what you want around brain health, what, you know, how you try to, your understanding of brain health and what you can do and what your approaches are. Um, we've also done some surveys around um, diagnosis, how quickly people get diagnosed, why don't they get diagnosed, um, uh, what about early diagnosis is intriguing or scary, mm. and what do you think about online tools for diagnosis. We've also done surveys on um, different kinds of symptoms, so we're doing actually a survey right now on um, behavioral symptoms and what that, how that affects the family, the family dynamic. And I've seen as I've been looking at some of the chats, some of that has been coming through in terms of agitation and stuff. Yeah, I think that these, the A-list is great. And I would encourage everyone that's listening today to go out to the A-list. Again, we're gonna put the links in the chat boxes so you can get connected, but you just sign up to be a member. I'm a member and uh, then they send you opportunities to participate in these great surveys. And then what I also love is that a lot of times, well, not only do you share that information with important, oops, I'm 
my yeah. light just went off. <laughs> um, uh, important uh, people within, you know, government, decision makers, pharma, um, you know, drug development, um, you share that, but then you share it back with the A-list yeah. group. So uh, sometimes, you know, you take a survey or you participate in research and you wonder what happened to that data. Uh, and that's what I think is another aspect about this group that's so great is that they share it back with you. So uh, mm -hmm. again, I would encourage you all to get involved with the A-list. It's really easy. I've taken some of these surveys. It's they're like maybe 10 minutes of your time. They're really simple. Oh, at most. Yes. At most, yes. So um, again, well, thank you for a question. What was sometimes, that? Sometimes we'll ask a one question survey. Man, you never get that these days. So uh, why? There's no excuse not to participate if you ask me. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate you you sharing that information, Terry, and for sharing your journey and your perspectives. And I know we have some questions coming in, so I would love to tackle some of these questions to the best of our abilities today. Um, so if you're listening and you have a question, uh, please chat them in. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you can put them in the chat box or the Q&A box. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. If you're on Facebook, all you have to do is comment your questions in, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, I know we've had, we had a few come in ahead of time, so we're going to just touch on a few of those questions. Um, and then we'll get to some of these questions that are coming in live. So um, I know, Terry, that you, you talked a little bit about um, caregivers keeping themselves healthy, both physically and mentally. Um, and we did have a question, somebody wanted you to expand a little bit more on your meditation practice. So um, sounds like you, you know, you did physical exercise and you meditated. So can you just talk a little bit more about that meditation? Uh, and if there's tips that you can provide to caregivers, that would be really helpful. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, most of the time, because well, especially initially, but even now, I'm so constantly so busy with so many things. I found that it's I have to fit in meditation. Mm. Uh, for me, I like to do it midday. <laughs> and it's funny that when I do that, I realize that my heart rate is up and all of my breathing is fast and everything because I've been so busy during the day. And it just brings me down. It just helps me to bring myself down to a more uh, I think a norm healthier place physically. Um, I use apps. So I've been using breathe and there's a bunch of apps that are out there that are really, I think, decent for very quick meditations up to 40 minutes. Um, but you can do a five minute meditation. And so that's what I've been doing. And then I do, uh, you know, try to get out. I have, uh, you know, weights, simple weights, so I'll do some simple weights. I'll do walking. I actually walk with family and friends a lot after, uh, at the end of the day, that type of thing. That's great. It kind of combines that social. I know you mentioned that earlier. Was, exercise is kind of your social outlet. So you can kill two birds with one stone there. Um, and then I like the suggestion of the apps. I also uh, use meditation apps. And for me, I my mind races at night while I'm trying to fall asleep. So I do the meditation app before I go to bed. Uh, and sometimes even as I'm falling asleep, there's some guided meditation. So if you haven't gone out there and looked at the app stores for your smartphone, um, uh, I would encourage you to do that. And if you don't have a smartphone, you can play some you know, soft music and just kind of close your eyes and, and try to zone out. So I think you're right, Terry, that can help kind of center you. Because uh, it is easy to, to get, you know, what the stresses of the day get to you in terms of your breathing and your heart rate. So thank you for those suggestions. Even when it's with stress. Yeah, it's exactly. Like it's a good day. <laughs> uh, you're feeling kind of jazzed about something, you know, you still could use that chance to slow yourself down and, and relax a bit. Absolutely. Uh, we had a, a kind of a comment slash question that came in uh, ahead of time from Karen. She said that she has no other family members to share responsibilities with, and she's mm -hmm. often hurt emotionally. Uh, we talked about how emotional this journey can be, because she's often hurt emotionally by the ungratefulness of her mother. She says very hurtful things to me, never says she's sorry, uh, and tells me instead to not be like that. Uh, she says she's really hurt and just really wants to run away from the situation. Uh, and she's asking, is there any advice that you uh, can provide? So any thoughts for Karen on that scenario? I know it's such a challenging um, situation. Um, so any thoughts? Yeah, yes. Um, 
So there's, I think there's a lot to unpack in, in yeah. <laughs> today. Um, the, the one thing I will say is, I know this is easier said than done, but I, you know, I try to think that that was not my mother when she was like that. Mm. You know, it, it's the, it's Alzheimer's. It's not my mother. Uh, and, you know, on a better day, my mother would not be talking this way. And we had our share of things for us. It was usually at like midnight when <laughs> she'd be walking around and, you know, I, I'd be worried about the household being disturbed. Um, and we would get into some words even. And, um, you know, I think that there's just no, you, you're gonna say things sometimes, you're gonna feel frustration sometimes. And I think now my mom forgives me for what I said in the middle of the night, the next day, frankly, she couldn't even remember I, that I would say anything, yell at her. Uh, and so, there's a piece of that, um, but when I behave that way, I felt really feel bad for myself. I'm the one in the long run that kind of suffers from it, so I really took that in and tried to think of ways to change that frustration <laughs> and that bad feeling uh, to it's you know, to kind of remove the emotion from it and from that situation. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy to do at all. Um, you're, and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to feel bad about the whole situation from time to time, but it's okay. It's going to be okay. And um, I think you just have to remember it's not the, your mother. It's not the disorder. It's the disorder. It's not your mom. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and it can be so easy to, you know, take offense to the hurtful words. And, and as you mentioned earlier, it's okay to have those feelings as a caregiver of, of being hurt and, uh, feeling frustrated and angry. And as you mentioned, you just have to acknowledge them and, um, and perhaps, um, you know, find ways to cope, whether it's journaling or joining a support yeah. group or even seeking out counseling can be helpful. Um, and in this scenario, Karen says she doesn't have any other family members or friends to share the responsibility with. Uh, but, you know, um, I would suggest to Karen, you know, look into options. I know you used in-home care, uh, such as Home Instead, um, you can also look for volunteer type respite programs through your church or through the area agency on aging. Um, right. And also if you, if you feel like you need help and assistance but can't afford it, uh, we actually do have a grant program, Polarity for Charity, where you can apply mm -hmm. for in-home respite care. And we'll put the link to that uh, in the chat box uh, and in the comments box so you can go out and apply. Uh, but it is, I think, important to take that time away so that you can um, take time for yourself and come back recharged because it can kind of, um, I don't want to say great on you, but can kind of yeah take its toll over it time. Will. There's, there, it cannot, there's, it's impossible for that not to happen. Yeah. Impossible. So the other thing I would say, it, it's really shocking that most of the time, uh, your own personal physician does not is not aware of your caregiving status, or at least not aware of the uh, you know the impact it's taking on your life. Yeah. And that that was from another we did another A list survey on that. Uh, and um, we have to be advocates for ourselves. And I just want to encourage you when probably the little that you go to your doctor, but um, to go to, you know, to speak with your doctor and say, I really need some support services. Do you have any thoughts about how to do that? Or, you know, are there any services in our area? Um, that might be another option. I've had to rely on neighbors. I had one weekend, my husband was at reserve duty, my sister was at the shore and I got hospitalized suddenly. Wow. <laughs> My mom was sitting out by the pool. <laughs> so I had to actually call a neighbor and say, can you pick up my mom? And so you're going to be in situations and they were great and they fed her and they took care of her. And you know, you'd be surprised at the kindness that's in your community when there's a need. And I think sometimes we don't want to ask, yeah. but we, you know, we just have to sort of figure out how to do that. I'm that way. I'm the controller. I'm the person who, you know, wants to get everything done and get it done right. And very difficult to ask for help 
Yeah. Uh, but I think that's something that you have to start to be come more comfortable doing. Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's not pride. It's just, you need, it's just a way to help yourself. Yeah. I think that that's a great insight. Um, so Karen, we hope that that's helpful to you in your situation. Um, we have another question that came in from Kay. She's curious about how you deal with your loved one with Alzheimer's that's easily agitated and goes into rages. So I think we could categorize that as agitation and maybe aggression or uh, that sort of a thing. Did you have any experience of that with your mom? I, I can also share a few tips uh, as well, but I'll let you go first, Terry. Yeah, my my mom would get agitated at night sometimes, and um, it's a very it's one of the most difficult situations that we face. So I definitely understand, and my heart goes out to you because I can can relate. Um, you know, I think part of it was in how I managed my communication with her was a big part of it. I, I really had to take a step back. I almost sometimes initially when it wasn't so bad, the agitation treated it like a game, like I gave different responses and tried to see how things landed <laughs> differently. Um, that sometimes worked, sometimes did not work depending on the topic. Um, you know, I think there are plenty of um, individuals out there on in Facebook communities and so forth that experience this that have probably have a lot of tips for you. Um, and certainly there is a role, I believe there's a role for medication at the right time, at the right dose. Um, I, I don't believe in medicating somebody so they're, you know, even less of themselves. But um, I do believe that there is a role for medication in helping when the agitation is too, uh, too much. Hmm. Yeah, I think you gave some, some, good, um, some good tips there, Terry. And yeah, it's kind of, I liked your example of, you know, answering the question or re responding in different ways to see, you know, if it changed the scenario. And, you know, we, we train our, our caregivers that work for us. Uh, when they're working with uh, an individual um, that's becoming agitated or um, aggressive, just sometimes if it's kind of the aggression side of things, just remove yourself from the, the scenario. You know, try to be in a different room, but keep an eye on them. Just kind of um, get yourself away from the situation. Uh, and then in a couple minutes when they seem to have kind of cooled down, enter the room like you just came home from the grocery store or something to see if maybe They've, they've had a chance to calm down and you can redirect them to another activity. I know Meryl shares um, how she has even a mirror uh, in one of the rooms that um, her husband was in most frequently. So she could kind of watch in the mirror, those mirrors that you kind of use yeah. when you're reversing out of the driveway or something, just so that she could, you know, both of them could be safe. He could have an opportunity to kind of um, come down from that agitated, aggressive state. So those are just a couple tips. Uh, we'll, we'll give uh, some more tips um, via a, a website link uh, in the chat boxes. So thank you for that question and we hope that that um, is helpful, helpful to you, um, Kay. Um, and so we've, we've had some just comments come in. I thought I, I'd like to share those just because I think they are good comments. Yeah. Um, Karen said, caregivers need to learn to forgive themselves early on. We get the test before we get all the answers with Alzheimer's. And I yeah. think that, that is well stated. You probably can relate to that. Yes. So, so Karen, thank you for that comment. I repeat um, it, Karen, I think that's a good line. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know. We're going to all start using that, that phrase. Um, and then... Uh, uh, there is Carol. She says that she, um, she she takes time for herself by going to therapy, run. Um, she goes to a caregiver support group. Um, uh, she's actually does poet poem writing um, as part of her support group with her group of friends, um, and it's a nice place for her to release her feelings. Uh, and then also taking time away. Um, uh, from the caregiving situation, having in-home care has been beneficial for her mental health. So thanks, thank you all for sharing what you're doing, because I think, again, this is a community where we're all able to share um, tips and, and wisdom with each other. Um, and so I think we're actually out of time, which makes me sad because this has been such a great chat, Terry. I have just been so grateful to you for 
for joining me today and sharing your personal experience, sharing how you've turned that into you know, advocacy work. You've you know, taken that fire that was inside of you and, and you're helping others um, to empower them through their caregiving journey through the A-list. And again, if you haven't joined the A-list, we did put the link below uh, in the chat boxes. So comments box, so you can join the A-list and take part in it. As Terry, you said, is, is that behavioral survey still open to people to participate in? The behavioral symptoms survey? Uh, yes, it is. So awesome. that will be forthcoming very shortly to people. Yes. Wonderful. Well, yeah, we hope that you go out there and participate in that survey um, and, and others. So um, again, thank you all for joining us today. We do have an upcoming chat next month. We're going to be talking about caregiving at the holidays. Uh, Terry, I'm sure over those years, you probably experienced plan. some Bump of this. Plan and plan. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my colleague, Molly Carpenter, who is the author of Confidence to Care, a great book on Alzheimer's care, she'll be joining me. We'll be talking about that holiday season, how to you know, make time for self-care, how to engage your loved one with Alzheimer's in the holiday festivities, and hopefully make it more of a joyous celebration for everyone. Uh, so we hope that you will join us. And the information will be out on Facebook. We'll send it to you in an email. Um, and so we look forward to that chat. But again, Terry, thank you so much for joining me, uh, for sharing with our community. I'm just so thankful and grateful to you for your time today. Thank you for having me and everybody. I'll be sending you all good vibes and uh, we're, we're here. So, yeah. Yes, wonderful. Well, everyone, wishing you a happy Thanksgiving if you celebrate that. Uh, and we'll see you next month. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.